is Carl Sansenrad, who will be talking about home control with Rebel 3. Yeah, before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, Max and his whole team. There are so many people, you know, from Ron and, and, and Robert and everyone, uh, and Greg, just everyone that made this conference possible and everyone that flew out from wherever in the world he came from to get together like this. I'd just like to thank everyone who's been part of that and the communities that influence in that and just uh, made it happen. So it's really cool. Um, well, so as you know, I've been, I've been busy. And uh, about a year and a half or so ago, that um, I actually went to a MEGA conference in Sacramento. That was the MEGA, what was it called? Amy West. And I, every few years, I go to one of those just to see kind of what folks are up to and maybe sell some of my old Amigas for, you know, some, for some good cash or something. <laughs> and, and I ran to a old friend of mine, Dale Luck, who did the graphics, all the graphics for you know, the MEGA uh, graphics library. And he's like telling me about this company he's working at. And he shows me a box that's about it's about the size of this little box here, so it's you know about this big. Um, and it's a company called Roku, and it's making this streaming player. And I kind of heard of this, this company, Roku. They were actually part of Netflix, and and it's they spun off to you know, they actually made Netflix for streaming uh, video player, and they spun off and became a separate company. And it's like oh, you should come down and see, you know, it's kind of interesting, fun stuff going on. And, um, so that's how I got down and, and ended up getting sort of sucked in. It's like you know, it's kind of like one of those things. Well, what do you want to do? And it's like I kind of describe it. Well, come on down. We'll you know we'll get you going. So that's what I've been up to. And uh, here's an example of of a streaming video player uh, from about a year ago. I can show you this now because it's actually released. You get it on Amazon. Um, this is a, a Roku um, streaming video player that actually uses the same chip that this camera is using. The same SOC, the Broadcom. 2835 SOC, uh, which is a really nice uh, little uh, SOC, you know, embedded system with 256, this is 256 megabytes of, of NAND and also 256 megabytes of, of DRAM on it. And uh, this is also a dual band 2x2 two two, um, Wi Fi device. So 2x2 two two means it's, um, it has dual receiver, I mean, dual uh, transmit receive chains. So it can be uh, doing the better kind of 11N sorts of sorts of uh, tricks. Need a little sticker on here. Let's see. Let me get this close off serial number. Yeah. So there. And things are really small. Man. So so to work on this, I sometimes I take a microscope <laughs> and you bring the soldering tip. Yeah, and the soldering tip is like this big thing coming in on this little, this little speck on there. But there's the, uh, you'll see on here the SOC and then the, the, uh, the NAND. And then there's also, um, so this plugs into an HTML port, but it's not any HTML port because you can't power this much circuitry off HTML. There's not enough, uh, enough current supply on HTML. So this is actually an MHL. So MHL, um, that's the kind of thing that keeps me away from Rebel. <laughs> Anyway, um, so to get on the presentation here, uh, I was looking at trying to find a way to get back into uh, doing, you know, something with Rebel, and uh, uh, I, I really wanted to solve a real-world problem, something that, um, that that meant something not just to to me, kind of intellectually, in terms of some fun little, you know, theoretical thing in Rebel, but really to, to anyone else in the world that was interested in the same kind of problem. Um, and I also decided I wanted to add something, you know, make a contribution to Rebel 3 in the community way that people are doing, and, and also document something in Rebel 3 that, that maybe is a mystery to a lot of people and they don't know how to do it. So um, this would give me a chance to sort of do more on that. And then, of course, in this case, to make Cindy happy, <laughs> because this all had come down to something that was happening in the house. And I'll, I'll show you the event that they got it all triggered. Um, we, I was walking through the house one day and I was smelling smoke and I was like, what's this nasty smell coming from? Because it wasn't a really nice smoke, you know, when things are, <laughs> when bad things are burning where metal is melting and stuff, it puts out really bad kinds of vapors. And I walked around like, this doesn't look good. And I opened the closet for the, the water heater and I see kind of like flames coming out the front of the water heater <laughs> there. And uh, you can see how it sort of smoked up the front and, and uh, what, what ended up happening here is after so many years of 
a propane running in this water heater, um, the, there was something corrosive in the propane that actually dissolved uh, the, the burner that was inside, the main burner, and actually had, had made holes in it, so it had escaped from its containment, and it was starting to move forward <laughs> towards, towards the main gas lines and things like that. So you know, we shut that down really fast, and uh, as a result, we ended up with no, no hot water for a few days, and I was doing a lot of replumbing of the house to put in a, um, an instant uh, hot water heater, because I thought that would be really cool. But then I went back to the drawing board on that, and I thought, you know, I've got a solar house. I should be using solar hot water. If you think about it, you know, to heat hot water in an average house, you're using like between a half a ton and a ton of, of um, you know, fuel per year. And so I thought, well, you know, it makes sense. But you always have to have some kind of backup on, you, on your water if you're heating it from the sun. And in my case, I thought electric backup would be good. And I actually had an electric water heater system in the basement for 20 years that I used earlier in building the house that, that I just put back in operation. And I thought this would be really expensive to put an electric water heater, you know, uh, especially in California where the rates of electricity are really super high. So, um, so we were controlling it and, and, and we started out just turning the circuit breaker on and off. So Cindy's like, oh, I'm gonna take a shower, you know, in an hour. So we turned the circuit breaker on and, <laughs> and so we had to remember to do this. And I thought, well, this isn't gonna last very long, you know. So I thought, well, I, I can use Rebel 3 to solve this problem and control the water on demand and also have a schedule and just do all the things that you do so well and you know, when you program a solution like this. Um, I've always wanted my house to do, have a lot more. Um, you know, when I was building it originally and designing it, I, 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 I thought of all the different things I could do in a house and, and a lot of the structure of the house is built in an engineering way, so you know it, it allows heat to rise up through the whole house and, and be collected on the top and either pulled out or, or, or brought all the way back down and kind of re, re injected at the, at the bottom. So it takes advantage of, of things like convection and stuff like that. Um, so I, I researched around for a solution to this, and I found these Insteon uh, controllers. And uh, here's an example of the water heater controller. So this is a 220 volt, 30 amp. Uh, Insteon device. It has it has two little lights on the front, the red light and the green light, so it's really easy. And there's a little switch you can push to, to turn it on right now or to turn it off right now. But um, the way these operate is there's um, uh, essentially through the power line a signal that's passed uh, over the power line that comes into the unit. It's a very kind of low speed uh, um, control signal that comes in. So, the next generation X10 is the way to think about these, a very similar technology to that. And I thought, well, once I have one of these installed for controlling the hot water, well, I can just, you know, come through the house and control all sorts of things. So there's an example of, a, of the, the appliance module. So that has, essentially has a relay in it and can control, you know, anything from like a coffee pot to, you know, the lights or whatever you have, fans in the house, that kind of thing. And, and uh, to, to talk to these, you need some way of getting onto the power line with your, your message. And so here's that. Here's a modem, a power line modem that um, takes a serial port input and then takes and modulates that onto uh, the, the power line and uh, sends it through the house. And the, the cool thing that the Insteons do that, that the X10 didn't do is they have built in uh, automatic uh, kind of like dual band relaying. So they can, they can actually go wireless to jump to places where, for instance, you may have too, too large a space or it's a completely different electrical system or whatever, they'll actually go wireless at 900 megahertz to the other unit. So it's, it's pretty cool. And uh, it's actually how, how it's, you know, there's the, uh, you can see the 60 hertz um, power on there where, and where the transmission is actually taking place at the zero crossover where you really don't have much happening. You know, there's, a, there's no, uh, there's no voltage at that point, so that's when the signal's transmitted and they encode a few bits and they use a number of uh, cycles of their um, 131 kilohertz signal to uh, encode, for instance, one bit. So it's, it's pretty reliable. Um, so I, I was thinking about the plan for um, this presentation. Well, well, the first thing is to interface the serial device, and Rebel 3 doesn't have a way to do that. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to write some way for Rebel 3 you know, to do that. And it's been a few years since I've done any kind of um, device or port work on Rebel 3, so I thought this will be interesting to kind of how, how much work will it be to get reacquainted with how those work, how those operate. Um, yeah, so both the device and the port handler. Um, and then I'll need to write some code for the Insteon 
and I, I had no idea how these Instinion devices worked or what the command sequences were like. And, and then also you send out the command sequence. The nice thing about, about them is close X10, you can also get back a response from the device so it can tell you what it's on or off or you know, what it's doing, which is, which is really handy so that you can have a positive control system. Uh, and then I wanted to be able to access it from any, any, any device in the house. I just wanted to be able to pick up my phone and say, oh, you know, we need hot water now or, or, or say like a 5, 5 a.m. kick on so that, you know, Cindy can take a shower in the morning or we can run the dishwasher or whatever. Or there could be a schedule where certain days it comes on automatically, that kind of thing. And then, uh, okay, so, so getting into writing the device, uh, that was interesting because, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of code involved in writing a device on Rebel 3. It's one of the things about Rebel 3 that was important to me and one of the reasons I did it was, in, in Rebel 2, the device model, and I should say the port model, got really complicated because we were trying to make ports look like series. And, and so we wanted to do inserts and things like that. And the problem with that model is it works great when stuff's in memory and you can, um, you know, everything's there so you can really know the size of the thing, you know, when you're at the head, when you're at the tail, all that kind of stuff. But when you're in a streaming model like networking, it gets to be much more of a problem to know what any of that means. The semantics gets kind of lost. And what ended up happening in Rebel 2 is everyone started using read I.O. So everything just, you know, kind of went away from this series, you know, series model to just use read I.O. like you would on any other uh, computing language. So, so Rebel 3 just kind of cut out the series model. It just went to a, a read-write type of model. Uh, it's also a much lower level. Um, Anyway, adding device is tricky. Uh, not that it's a lot of code, but there are a lot of different little places that you've got to modify things in Rebel to um, to add a device. And so, so here are the files that I modified. I had to modify to add a serial device. So, so the main serial device is dev serial .c, and I just did a POSIX version of it. Uh, if someone wants to do, I'll put this on the on the Git. Um, and if anyone wants to do a, a Windows version or whatever version of it, they can. They're free to use as a model and just you know fill in the blanks for uh, any other types of uh, operating systems. I, I guess I should back up one step and explain why in Rebel 3 there's a device model and a port model, because this is also new in Rebel 3. Um, the Rebel 3 core is meant to be a completely isolated piece of code that has uh, really no dependencies on the I.O. system you know, of, of whatever operating system you're running. Uh, so you communicate from this kind of nice little isolated bubble using through ports out through the, um, the kind of very minor abstract interface out to devices. And then devices are specific to your operating system. So this, this keeps you in a mode where Rebel 3 core can operate on anything, I mean you can move it just within minutes to port it to almost any device, and you know, I've ported it you know, to this, and it takes like a minute you know, to, you know, to really port it over to like a embedded control or stuff like that. And, that. and then there's, you know, you need to tell the system that there is a new device. Um, that's what some of these other, most of these are one line changes in most of these files. The important thing about this was the, the knowledge to know what to modify. It's like the plumber who's fixing your, your water heater. And it's, <laughs> You know, it's $5 for the parts, but it's $100 for just knowing what part to change, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so let's go, let's dive in now and go to uh, device serial. So that's the first thing was uh, adding the actual device that will do the work, you know. And these are devices that actually map commands a lot like the IO, you know, the Octals on, on Linux, or even you think back to the Mega IO days. Um, now, actually, one of the things that I'm finding is I work more in Linux. I see more of the Amiga kind of, you know, people who wrote device drivers and stuff for Linux were like, oh, this guy came from the Amiga, I can tell, you know. Um, but, there, but there's essentially enums that, that, that point to different commands and give you different commands. So for a serial, simple serial device, you really just need to open a device, close the device, and then read and write it. Um, for a more deluxe model where you might want to have it um, doing some things and telling you when it's done, uh, that you can actually add a, a few other commands, but this is just a simple one. So here's open. So this is C code. Uh, I guess it could be wrote, written in, you know, um, some, some other language like red. But um, so this is really where all the work is done is in the open, which is just a regular, you know, Linux style open. Uh, the dev, uh, you know, 
if we append the path, uh, the path in this case is like TTYS0 or TTYUSG, whatever. Uh, okay, so right here, so there's the open fail. There's um, an include file which lists all these and explains what they are. So this would report back through the port system to tell the port that the open fails. So it's just a simple way of communicating uh, those types of failures. Um, here's, here's a set serial. This is, in this case, I'm passing the baud rate of the port through on the, the file size parameter that happens to be part of this request um, structure. So um, just so I didn't have to do another, uh, another yet another um, union within the within the C code because I just typed in this out fast for this presentation. So so there's um, where actually most of the work gets done in terms of setting up the serial port for the baud rate, you know, parity. Um, RTS, CTS, all, all of that kind of stuff happens in the set zero. It's all pretty much normal uh, Linux stuff, and I'll, I'll post all of this onto the GitHub so you can see it. The devices in Rebel 3 are by default asynchronous, um, so just because they return doesn't mean they're finished with what they're doing. Until you get this done back, you don't know that they're, they're actually finished. And um, So then here's the read serial that this, um, again, just very simple set of uh, you know, the, the request is passed in from, you know, across the interface. Uh, it has an ID field, which is was filled out earlier in the open, which is the handle on the file. And that, that handle is then used to read uh, the amount of data you requested and the length you requested. So you can see there's a very close coupling um, in level three between the port, what the port's asking for and what we're really doing in the, in the operating system. So it's very lean, easy to write. Um, but it's, but it's a whole different model from Rebel 2. It's not, there's no extra buffer happening here. The buffering is very minimal. Um, you'll see in the port where the buffer gets, gets created and you have a lot of control over that, how you want to manage that. Because that's really important for like doing streams. You want to go manage the buffers really well. And you don't want me to try to guess at what your buffering model would be. Because it's, it's going to, you know, in the case of the stream, it would be a very complex buffering model. Um, so again, there's no as RFE bad read uh, for the case where the read failed, and then in this case it's done because it's read whatever was there. This read, uh, if you look at the open, it, it had just a non-blocking read. So essentially there's nothing there to return zero, and, and you continue on. Uh, on the port side, so that's the device side, and that's really, I mean, there's just there's a read and there's a write that looks almost exactly the same, and uh, a few more lines, and that's it. It's, I don't know, maybe a total of a page of C code, maybe a page and a half of C code to write the device. And then within Rebel 3 itself, the, the ports are, are like, you might think of them as kind of the, the way that the, this external data gets brought into whatever Rebel form it needs to be in. And so in the case of a, a serial device, and especially talking to an Insteon uh, controller, which is binary, probably binary kind of commands, you know, when you have an action like open, you know, the system says, okay, there's an open, and, and what am I given as an argument to open? Oh, okay, it's, it's a URL, and I'm going to convert the URL to, um, you know, to, to a path, and doing there right here is the, the do device. So, so we're calling the OS um, open command for the device that, that, um, that it found that was the serial device that, that came out of the, uh, the, the uh, first part of that, that URI. So, and, and all of this is within a, it's not opened already kind of you know state check. Uh, so so typically a port handler has a you know it's not open section and it's an open section, and uh, that allows you to have these actions behave differently easily behave differently depending on the state of the, uh, the port. So then here's the read action uh, in the system object. There's a bunch of standard kinds of structures, really, they're, they're, they're not even objects, they're really just sort of templates, you might think of them for, um, for where things go and what, what kind of values are stored for particular things. So here's uh, a port uh, data uh, field that's requesting from the port, so that, that gets you the, the field. It might be empty because if you've never used it, so you'd allocate here, and, and I allocate like 32K or something as a starting point for that. Uh, and grab the series, um, you know, check to make sure that's, you know, the length that I needed extended if it's, if it's not, and I extended, I'm extending here in chunks of 32K, or roughly 32,000. 32, 
So you can see there, there's where some buffering, you know, this lets you kind of decide how you want to do um, your buffering. And then uh, uh, I get whatever, you know, length I have available as, as um, the result of, you know, possibly extending it or not extending it doesn't matter. And I, I, I get a pointer to the, the tail position where I'm going to start appending because I'm always wanting to append onto the end of my request. So as I'm, as I, as I'm basically calling the read, it just keeps appending and pending to the end of the, uh, the series that is the buffer, the main buffer for this particular port. Uh, and then here's the read. So the code you saw earlier for the read is getting called here. And this is extremely lean. It's, it's just, it's this, this macro, C macro here that you see is passing with a very small number of instructions back out to the device layer and calling that read. So all of this is really super fast. You can do incredibly, when I wrote Rebel 3, the first thing I did is wrote TCP and then did some speed comparison and it didn't do everything. I, I, I couldn't find anything that ran as fast as Rebel 3 for doing like TCP, you know, file transfers and things. So it's so nice you guys have the source code now because you can actually go look at this. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 all these files are P, under, sorry, P underscore whatever the, um, the port handler name is. You can look at some, you can go look at TCP or whatever. But, but part of the model is you've got you to know when to copy your bytes back out to another, you know, rebel series. You don't want to necessarily pass this buffer, although you could pass the buffer back out. This buffer is appending to itself asynchronously. And so, you know, you want to grab whatever you requested and pass that back. So the next, the next part of the presentation is going to cover quickly the, um, the codes and how these codes work. And I, I got on the net and, and looked up, is there any simple way to do this? And I found some nice person that actually documented it in BASIC, which is OK. That's fine. I can take the BASIC program, which was, I don't know, 12 lines or whatever, and make it a one-line Rebel program. And, and, um, and I thought, well, how will Rebel deal with binary for doing this and that kind of thing? I thought, well, actually, it worked out really well. So the PLM modem uh, takes a binary command and sends it to these, the device. And the device, each device has an address, and I'll show you that. It's like an IP address, kind of. And um, that device then processes whatever that command is, um, you know, error checks it, whatever, and then sends back a message to the, to the PLM, which is your confirmation that it worked. And all this is done in binary. It's not, you know, it's not like XML or anything like that, because it has to be just a few, you know, a few bits um, to go down the power line. Reasonably reliably, uh, and it's, it doesn't take much to put a few lines of rebel to actually do all this. So here's a here's a device and you can see right here um, the the um, address of it. All these devices have the addresses listed on there. Once you know that address, then you can control it. If you don't know that address, you can't you you cannot control that device. It's it's like you can't send out a broadcast like you can in, in Wi-Fi world saying everyone tell me who you are or an ARP like you would on, on TCP IP, where you'd say, who is this you know, person, who is this unit, to get, no, you have to know that number. So, if you, so here's uh, one of the command tables uh, from their documentation. It's you know, documentation that shows the particular commands I'm using. So it kind of describes what the arguments are. Really, in this case, I just want to turn them on and off. I don't care about the brightness of things like the water heater. <laughs> and so um, there are like 30, 30 pages of these commands like that. So they made this, they took something with a relatively simple idea of they want to control this, control that, and they, like so many things in the world today of computing and technology, they just added commands that do all kinds of things that it's like, I think we could have simplified that. Maybe, maybe they should just send rebel, rebel, <laughs> rebel strings or something. Um, okay, so, so here's an example of the command structure that's used. Um, there's a, there's a little header part that tells the unit, that tells the modem, okay, we're going to be sending out a command, and that's that 0262 code. Uh, those are, you know, the text for the bytes. There's that address that I showed you off the unit, 213. There's uh, some flags, and these flags are, are just telling, uh, in this case, the 0F is saying, I want you to replicate that command through three relay points, maximum. And, 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 and I think it's the result also for three relay points. And don't talk to anything outside of three hops from, from where I am. And, uh, and then there's the actual command that I showed you from the table there, the 11 FF. So the 11 means turn the unit on. FF means full brightness, basically, you know, give it full power. Uh, there's the, the rebel to send the command. This would be simple now that we've created the serial port. So there's the other half of 
or the third of all of what we saw earlier, there's an open serial, the new port type. And you can see the URLs, really, the, the, the uh, device name, TTYS0, uh, but it could be a USB device or whatever, and then uh, communicate 19.2 uh, baud. And there's the, you know, it's that easy. So I'm going to put this out there because um, this is a lot easier than anything else for controlling these instantly on. I bet we could get like I don't know, a couple thousand people using Gravel just to control their, their instantly on devices in some simple, you know, easy to manage, easy to debug way. So then uh, you know you get into your Rebel mode of okay, now we're now we're really starting to make some some things happen. And say, well, I need a, I need a little database for the devices around my house. This is this is really complicated. The other programs that are out there in Rebel, it's just as easy as I've got I've got words related to different devices. So in this case, there's a water heater. It's got that address. I got a little string in case I want to write a, a little GUI someday where it pops up to the main water heater. And then I put the model number in there so I know, you know if I have to order a replacement or something. It's like that was the on model number. If I want to look up the specs or something, that's that's the model number that I can use for that. And then same thing here on, on the command that I go with. In this case, just the logic or a word, and uh, this is building the, that command binary. So it's very straightforward because this command head is already a binary, and so it just pens all these other binaries together. He writes at the serial port, says, "Okay, let's see if it happens." So easy. So then here we we're gonna create a little buffer for holding our response, and then we're gonna sit there. We're just gonna you don't know when these devices are gonna going to finish kind of getting the command result back to you. So what I do is I just do this little kind of slow 0.2 second loop until it's kind of finished giving me anything. And, and at that point, I say, OK, now I've got something I can look at to see whether it got, got the command and um, responded to it. So here is the parse command, just by parsing the binary, which is really one thing about parse is you can so easily parts the binary in Rebel 3, you can actually provide a variable that you're going to compare against. So this out is actually the command that was sent because everything is echoed on NCDON. So the PLM will echo back the command just to make sure that you can just you know, do a byte by byte comparison on it to make sure that they got that far. The 06 code man had understood the command, and then the rest of this came back from the, the unit I was controlling. That said, okay, here's here's what I think you said, and this is actually what I did, and, and here's the address that it came from, and this is actually the address of the PLM, which I don't care, because that's me, that's, that's that's my unit, and this is the command that I did. So that's the response, and there it is one line, I, I parsed it out, that returns true or false from parse that comes back as check response is done. So then, this is my heat command, you know, turn the heat on or turn the heat off, and um, so I wanted to be fairly reliable, so it's going to retry. So it's going to send the command to the water heater, whatever the on or off was that I passed in, and just keep doing that for this number of retries, and then break uh, out of this loop when you're done. And if it didn't work, then you better tell me about it. So most of the time it works. I don't think I've actually ever seen it fail. It's possible to have these devices far enough apart, or if you have power line interference, or if you have computers plugged in, you know, they're creating a lot of noise online, you can actually end up with a problem there. So. I didn't want to have to uh, fire up a big web server to be able to use my phone or whatever around the house. I wanted a Rebel web server, something very, very small. There, I'd written some documentation earlier that I put out about how you write a simple um, server. Uh, who was it? That, that someone took it and wrote a little micro mini HTTP server out there. Who was it? Andreas. Andreas. Andreas did that? Yeah, yeah, which was really nice because he'd taken it. He actually did a really nice job on that little server. And I don't need CGI for interpreting these commands because I can directly interpret the um, results coming back from the web browser and decide whether, you know, what people click on. And then there's just a little sprinkling around some HTML to make it all work. And there and there you go. So so there's this, you know, this is my phone and Cindy's phone and the iPad and you know, the computers, whatever around the house, just let us control our water heater. And it's been running for a long time without crashing <laughs> in Rebel 3. And, and uh, it's easy to extend to add other devices and stuff. It's just a baseline. And I just really want, I, you know, when I say I want basic HTML, you're probably thinking, oh, a few pages of HTML. No, I want it just, here's what, six or seven lines of HTML. 
Um, the method is a get, so it comes back, and I'm just interpreting that line directly within um, directly within the web server. So, so this is the basic, you know, Rebel three. What a basic Rebel three web server looks like. Where you open the port, you, everything's in asynchronous. They set up a, a, a callback on the awake, um, and then you and then you wait for whatever you, you know whatever's going to happen there. That's your main wait. That's a one second timeout that I would occasionally use for debugging and seeing what my status was on things. And there's the wake. There's the wake um, callback. It's, it's got to go through that whole. It's a listen socket, right? So then once the listen is got a connection on it. Now I've got to really open the real, the real um, connection uh, to the client. And um, and there's there's so there's the main loop of the web server right there. And everything's advanced in Rebel three. So it's a, it's a complete combined stream of events that comes back, and you uh, take that and you know fulfill the, the requests. Um, you know the request right there. There you have these different kinds of states that come back from the event. So that that the read was finished, that the write was finished, which is called wrote. That's the, the request. Uh, so this is actually this, this is where it's parsing the get string back from the browser. Um, it's a, it's picking up a default kind of index page, taking the command that's passed back from the get and just making it a word, and then it calls. There's the do house, which was um, yeah, well, this is pretty. It actually changes the color of the screen to be red. Red if the heater's on, and blue if it's off, kind of thing, and then writes it out, and that's it. So, works great. Uh, didn't take much time. Most of the time was in writing the device and the port, and then to Rebel 3. I could extend it just, you know, in seconds, add other things to it. I always like on, on tutorials and documentation to see the simple example first. It's like the hello world. So this is like the hello world of devices. You know, just do the most basic thing. People will take that and they'll learn from it and they'll do all kinds of wonderful things. And um, we'll see if some of the people start using Rebel 3 for instant on control, you know. Give them the easy way to do it. You might start adopting them. You might get some more users involved in Rebel. I think that's it.